Hey everyone, we're going to go through a game today between a legend of the game, William Steinitz, versus a player called Augustus Mongredian. Uh, and this game was played in the year 1862, where Steinitz was actually the best player in Vienna at the time, and he got an invitation to play in the British Grand Tournament in London. And he actually finished 6th out of 14 players. But notably, this was the game that stood out in the whole tournament, and actually won a prize for the best game and even Adolf Anderson apparently acknowledged it to be the best and most bold game he'd seen so let's take a look in this game Steinitz is playing white Mongredian is playing black so Steinitz played the move e4 and we get a center counter with the move d5 Steinitz took the pawn on d5 with the move e takes d5 and black recaptured with the queen White played knight c3 to hit the queen on d5, and black retreated it back to d8. And white played the move d4, gaining some space in the centre and opening up the squares for the bishops. And black played e6. Not the most aggressive move, and only the third most popular in the database at the moment. But it stops the move d5 from being played, but the only problem is it hinders the bishop on c8 from getting developed. Steinitz continued with knight to f3, black played knight to f6, and white played bishop to d3, so getting the bishop on a very nice square. Bishop e7 from black, so very solid, both sides castle, and white played the move bishop to e3. Queen e2 was also an option here, where black could have probably continued with knight c6 and maybe rook to d1. And this is a variation Kasparov gave in his book, My Great Predecessors, Knight to b4, Bishop c4, Knight to d5, and Knight to e4, followed by capturing twice, which actually is quite even. Maybe white has a slight advantage in this position. But in the game, Steinitz decided just to develop, which is fair enough. Bishop to e3, very solid indeed. And black played the move b6, so obviously got a Fincetta there, Bishop to b7. Pairing maybe c5 as well. So white played knight to e5. This covers the c6 square. Stops black moving the knight c6 straight away. Black played bishop to b7. And f4 from Steinitz. So he has two pawns supporting this knight on e5. It's a very solid piece in the centre of the board. So black's got to dislodge it. And he plays knight to d7. Which seems like a good way to do this. Or at least counteract this knight in the center with this move. Now a variation that was given was perhaps white could have played f5 in this position. But after e takes f5, rook takes f5, black has knight takes e5, and after takes again, black may be able to play knight d5 followed by capturing twice. And after queen g4 and g6, it was actually said that white doesn't have the advantage anymore. This is actually quite an even game. So maybe this is why Steinitz didn't go in for this variation. A bit too risky in this position, f5. So instead, white played queen e2. A very nice move, just developing once again, getting the queen off the back rank. There's nothing wrong with this move. Black played knight to d5, so hitting the bishop on e3. And Steinitz just took, followed by e takes d5. Maybe bishop takes d5 was another idea, but then white actually has c4, so hitting the bishop. If the bishop retreats, white can play rook a, d1, and has a very nice setup. So perhaps this is why Mongredian didn't go in for this bishop takes d5 in this position. So again, he took with the pawn, e takes d5. And now Steinitz plays a very crafty move. He played the move rook to f3. And I've pointed this bishop at this pawn on h7 because let's say black plays a lazy move like a6. White now has bishop takes h7 check. If the king takes, white can play rook h3 with check. King g8 is the only move. And then white can play queen h5, threatening mate on h8. And unbelievably, the only way to stop this is bishop to h4 whereby white can just take and black's got to sack the queen. And this should be an easy win for white in this position. So after Steinitz played rook to f3, bishop h7 is a major threat. So what can black do in this position? 
Well, there's several moves, and in the game I think Black played a very solid one, but let's see where he can go wrong. For instance, if he played knight takes e5, white could follow up with f takes e5. And if now f6, white can play rook h3, and if g6 to protect everything, maybe play f5 next move, white actually can play rook takes h7, and if king takes, there's queen h5 with check because the g6 pawn is pinned against this bishop. So this would be a very nice game for white. So that's what happens if knight takes e5. Knight to f6 was another potential candidate move that black could play to protect h7. But white gains an advantage once again with rook h3, and if bishop c8, now play f5 to block. If bishop d6, there's bishop g5. After h6, bishop h4, it gets very messy. This is a very complicated variation. But after rook e8, bishop b5 hitting the rook. Bishop takes f5. Bishop takes e8. The queen recaptures. Rook f3. Bishop g4. White plays bishop takes f6. After bishop takes f3, queen takes. G takes f6, knight to g4. White now clearly has the edge because black's got terrible pawns on the f file. Even though they're a pawn up, this should be easy pickings for white in this endgame. So that was a very complicated line of moves. But in the actual game, black decided to play f5, keeping it simple and blocking up the bishop on d3. However, Steinitz continued his attack, rook h3, threatening to play queen h5, attacking this h7 pawn. So g6 was played by black to cover this square. And amazingly, Steinitz played an ultra-aggressive move now. He played the move g4, trying to open everything up, smashing up f5. Um, and black has two options. Knight takes e5 was actually the better move that black should have played in the game. This is because after f takes e5, if bishop c8, g takes f5, bishop takes f5, there's no problem for black anymore. Black's got a very solid position, and this is a very even game. So that's what black should have played. Should have played knight takes e5. But black in the game decided to play f takes g4. And this just opens everything up for white now. Again, queen takes g4 was a really good move that white could have played. And after takes an e5, white should recapture with the d-pawn. And if bishop c8, white can play e6. And for instance, if queen d6, white's got some very nice moves like bishop takes g6 with a great attack for white. However, after black took on g4 with the f-pawn, Steinitz now played rook takes h7. And black can't really capture this rook because if king takes h7, then white can play queen takes g4. After knight takes e5, f takes e5, the g6-pawn is under threat from the bishop and the queen. So if queen e8, white has queen h5 check. And if king g7, there's a nice array of moves. So like queen h6 check, king g8, bishop takes g6, attacking the queen. Rook f7 to block and defend the position. But now if white finds a move king h1 to play rook g1, white's got a very nice winning game. This is because after bishop f8, queen h5, bishop g7, White can play rook g1. After king f8, rook g3, bishop c8, bishop h6, and bishop e6. After bishop takes g7, white is now in a 1 position. Because after king e7, there's bishop takes f7, bishop takes f7, and bishop f6 check. After king d7, there's rook g7, and white's going to pick up an extra piece. For instance, king e6 to defend the bishop doesn't work due to queen h3 checkmate. So apologies for that absolutely complicated variation, but it had to be shown why the king can't take the rook on h7. So black didn't go in for this. Instead, he took the knight on e5, knight takes e5 first, and f takes e5. But now after king takes h7 from black in the game, after queen takes g4, this just actually transposes into what we just looked at in the analysis. So again, if black played queen e8 in this position, there's queen h5 once again. 
followed by king g7 to protect the pawn. But then queen h6, king g8, bishop takes g6, rook f7, and this nice move, king h1, followed by rook g1, where white is winning. After queen takes g4, hitting g6 once again, in the actual game, black didn't protect the pawn with the queen. He protected the pawn with the rook, so rook to g8. Steinitz continued the attack with queen h5 check. Again, this pawn is pinned against the bishop on d3. And after king g7, white's got to be a bit careful. For instance, queen takes g6 here would lose to king h8 because the rook is pinning the queen. So in this position, Steinitz played queen h6 check. After king f7, there's queen h7 check. And in the game, he played king to e6. Just note, rook g7 doesn't work due to bishop takes g6 check. And if king f8, there's check. Rook g8 and bishop h6 is checkmate. So, after queen h7, he played king e6. And queen h3 check was played by Steinitz. So, stopping the king escaping to d7. King f7 is forced. And rook f1 was played by Steinitz in the game. A move like e6 would have won quicker, because after e6, king e8, white can play queen h7, threatening queen f7 mate. If queen d6 to escape, there's queen takes g8, it's bishop f8, and bishop g5, and there's literally no way for black to stop the bishop taking this g6 pawn, and checkmating the black king. But in the game, Steinitz played rook f1 check. Still, white is absolutely smashing black in this position. King e8 was played and queen e6. So hitting the rook on g8. The rook moved to g7 and white played bishop g5 because the bishop on e7 is pinned. So black played queen to d7. Bishop takes g6 now from Steinitz. So check. The rook's forced to take. If the queen takes g6, black played king to d8, and white had a very nice finish with rook f8 check. So the bishop on e7 is pinned, so it can't take the rook. Queen e8 is the only move, and Steinitz finished with queen takes e8, checkmate. A very nice aggressive game from white. And as Lasker called it, he called it a vigorous and enterprising play from Steinitz. And even Chigurin actually said games that were deemed brilliant in recent international tournaments were no match for this one. He said that in 1890. So that's um, at least 30 years of nice praise and remembrance of this game. So this was just one of many games that I hope to look at from Steinitz, who was a very uncompromising and aggressive type of player. So it's very much worth looking at some of his games. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this quick analysis of this game. If you want to look at this game further, check it out on that chessgames.com. I'll just copy and paste the moves I've put in the description below, and you can copy them into Chessbase. It should work. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the analysis. Please drop me a like, comment, or subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Also hit that notification button so you can check out my videos when they come up. And I'll see you next time.